try and stay within the limits of the microphone, so otherwise we don't. I mean, we're really trying to do it. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Well, it's a packed auditorium this uh, this lunchtime. I've, I've just said to Professor Colvin, has she got a lot of friends, or, or is she just a fantastic speaker? And she says both, both. So, um, so thanks very much for coming. My name is Tom Farden, and I'm uh, the organizer and chair of Grand Rounds. It, uh, it, it fills my heart to see the audience so big today. So thank you very much for coming. Um, and remember that we're here every week. So uh, next week, uh, John Irving, consultant cardiologist and friend of mine is going to come and talk about the BBC scandal of um, whether coronary artery bypass grafts are better or worse than doing PCI. Um, this is big news a few months ago after a large trial that, was, that showed that perhaps there's not as big a difference as you might think. So do come for that next week. The next week after that, we have nothing. There's a gap in the rotor. So if you're sat there thinking you could do a good job of this and you've got an interesting, fascinating talk you'd like to give or anything at all you'd like to st you could just want 40 minutes to stand here and tell us about then please get in touch with me um, and I'll slip you into the rotor otherwise it's probably slides of my summer holiday cycling in France that's about what you're going to get okay so um, I'd like to thank Leslie for coming on today particularly because she did have a slot back in November but I double booked the slot so she very graciously moved out of, the, out of that position so, uh, so it was the DCAT lecture wasn't it that could have instead so Ewan has come <laughs> to, today uh, so thank you very much for doing that you were, you were very gracious um, she's going to talk to us today about the challenges in chronic pain management as I said last week I think we all have patients no matter what, what bit of medicine we're in who have chronic pain issues and I know I struggle with that um, it's a, they're challenging patients to deal with but I think you said 18% of patients have a chronic pain issue so this is a really big issue um, so without further ado thank you very much for coming Leslie Colvin Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm not sure if my slides will match up to your cycling holiday slides, but I'll do my best. Um, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about the epidemiology of chronic pain, how we assess it, and then focus on some of the areas that are recognised as being current clinical challenges and how we might go about improving our management in these areas. Quick declaration of interests. I don't normally get to Grand Rounds because I'm usually in a clinic, so I don't know if this is normal or not. There we are. So, first of all, I thought it would be useful to start with the definition of what pain is. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So, we need to be able to feel pain in order to protect ourselves um, and in order to survive. So, acute pain does have a function. However, in a significant number of individuals, and for reasons that we don't fully understand, it may progress onto chronic pain, which is a pathological condition where the system has gone wrong. Um, there was certainly um, several years ago an understanding that pain was a symptom. Chronic pain is now recognised as a disease in, as, in its, as a, an entity in itself uh, and a chronic long-term condition. Um, chronic pain, which is defined as pain that lasts for longer than three months, um, figures uh, from the Grampian region is that it affects about 18% of the Scottish population at some point during their life. So some of you may suffer from chronic pain, I would guess that most of you will know at least one individual in your uh, family and friend circle who will have an element of chronic pain that impacts on their activity. Is it a problem at a global level? Um, the Global Burden of Disease study um, has looked at that, and low back pain has topped the list for quite a number of years. Um, and within the top seven, uh, four of those are chronic pain conditions. So it's a significant problem not just within Scotland and the UK, uh, but at a global level that we need to begin to understand better in order to address it. Uh, the figures of 35 to 51% are from a relatively up-to-date systematic view and meta-analysis looking at the UK prevalence. And that figure is probably higher since the 18% in Scotland because that is a more recent paper and we have an ageing population. Your likelihood of getting chronic pain increases with age, also if you're female. And we know that it affects about 28 million adults in the UK, so a significant issue. The sign guideline for the management of chronic pain was published in December 2013 and within that we identified a number of clinical challenges, um, predict particularly assessment of pain, which you may think should be relatively straightforward, 
Long-term use of opioids, which I'm going to focus on in a little bit of detail today because I think that is a major problem, and also neuropathic pain, which has been identified as a condition that's A, difficult to diagnose, and B, difficult to treat effectively. So that, that, those are the areas I'm going to try and cover today. Modern pain management, chronic pain management, is pretty well underpinned by the biopsychosocial model of pain, which considers all the different aspects, so not just the sensation of nociception, the, 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 the pain pathways, but all the other factors which impact on how pain and distress are perceived and how they impact on any one individual. So in terms of formulating management plan and forward planning for treatment, unless you take account of all those aspects, we're unlikely to be successful going forward. So first clinical challenge, pain assessment. The first step of pain management is comprehensive assessment because we know that everyone is individual. So while most of our studies look at an average response to a treatment, everyone with chronic pain and indeed for other treatments are individuals. So it's that approach of assessing it in a very careful and detailed way so that we can understand at an individual level how best to direct our therapies. And the therapies that are available to us, I think, fall neatly into those categories, psychological therapies and physical therapies, while there are a whole number of pharmacological therapies that we can use, I'm going to talk about them in quite a bit of detail today. In fact, probably the most effective management going forward are the top two so for physical and psychological approaches to managing chronic pain and increasing physical activity. There are also stimulation therapies, both very easily accessible and more high-tech, spinal cord stimulation, uh, and injection and ablation therapies for use in specialist centres, um, and the evidence for those is relatively limited. One of, the, one of the problems with assessing chronic pain is that there's not any gold standard, there's not a blood marker to say that you're in pain or not. And I think this study from one of my collaborators, Irene Tracy, down in Oxford, who does neuroimaging studies, illustrates this point quite nicely. So this was a study done in healthy volunteers, medical students, um, and she burnt them. And she burnt them in order to produce relatively severe pain. Um, she had a reasonable number of volunteers, interestingly. Um, and what she did was she recorded that and she also imaged the brain to see which areas of the pain neuromatrix light up in response to the painful stimulus. And you can see that expected areas light up. Those individuals had a cannula in and remifentanil, which is a strong, potent opioid that comes on as a very fast onset and offset time. When she started infusing that but didn't tell the, the participants that she was infusing it, she burnt them again. And you can see, you can see there there's a small but significant decrease in the pain score, down to about 55 out of 100. So there is a pharmacodynamic effect of a strong opioid. That's reassuring. She then told them that she was starting a very strong painkiller, and you can see the impact of the expectation of analgesia is much greater, actually, than the pharmacological effect itself. So you get a much greater drop in the pain score. And then the final bit of the experiment was where she told the individuals that she was stopping the infusion, stopping the strong painkiller and burnt them again, and almost completely reversed the effect of a potent intravenous opioid. So that tells you something about how complex it is when we're assessing patients either in the clinic or indeed in the clinical trial setting to see whether or not we're making a difference. Hearteningly, the, the brain imaging, so the neuronal activation, does change. So you can see with um, intravenous opioid, there's a decrease in neuronal activation, some impact with the positive expectancy, but we don't see that return to baseline, although the patient perception has returned to baseline. So that's a potential tool in order to try and understand things a bit better if we're looking at new therapies um, in order to manage it. But I think it's also important as clinicians to remember that what we say to the patient is actually very important in the, painful exper in the pain experience. So... That's part of the assessment. So a hidden problem, there are, are quite a number of publications that show that within both the acute and the community setting, there are significant levels of moderate to severe pain. So as we speak, within this hospital, there are likely to be about 60 to 70% of the patients in the hospital in moderate to severe pain. Um, and you may think that's not correct, but I suspect if we looked at it, that is what we would find. Part of that is due to the inadequate assessment of the pain, both the severity and type of pain. And we know in a busy ward-based setting, often other factors will, come, will, be, will be rated above assessing and managing pain. 
Another thing, particularly with neuropathic pain, is that it can be difficult to diagnose. We often think of neuropathic pain as a chronic problem, and that's certainly what I see in the clinic, but there's good evidence that it can occur acutely in the acute setting, for instance, in the post-operative period. And unless you assess it properly and manage it properly with specific targeted management, it's not going to be successful. And this was figures from a European study that showed it takes nearly 20 months before neuropathic pain is diagnosed in the UK. If you live in Germany, it's about seven months. So that's where you need to go for the neuropathic pain. On the other side of the general assessment of just asking about whether or not patients have pain, which we're not currently doing well, there's also specialist assessment, which we can use to try and understand a little bit more of the underlying mechanisms so that we can link the signs and symptoms that we see in the patient before us and individualise the treatment, because that is without doubt one of the challenges. So if you have someone with neuropathic pain and you're, you have potentially 20 different medications that you can use, each of which takes a minimum of two to three months to titrate to effect, you're looking at a very long time if it's the 20th drug before you hit the one that actually works for that patient. So we really need to be able to understand the mechanisms better in the individual clinical setting. And also to help us understand the risks as to who's at higher risk, for instance, of developing persistent post-surgical pain or pain after chemotherapy. So part of the detailed uh, testing is termed quantitative sensory testing, which may potentially be used to help us individualise that treatment. Um, For those of you not familiar with it, it's used to investigate evoked pains and look at the function of predominantly of peripheral nerves. It has advantages over nerve conduction studies, particularly for painful neuropathic pain where the C-fibres are involved, because nerve conduction studies don't particularly look at C-fibre function in any great detail. And it's also looking at the function rather than the physiology. One of the questions is, does it have a role in the clinic beyond what I can do in a, in a research lab? Is there potential that we can use it within the clinical setting in a much simplified version? In order that we can start to try and understand which of the peripheral nerve fibres are involved and are are activated in the pain syndrome, or indeed if it's more predominantly centrally mediated. Because clearly, if you're looking at centrally mediated pain, you're absolutely wasting your time if you use a peripherally directed treatment. So that's part of the assessment process. So that detailed phenotyping and understanding of the mechanisms of how the peripheral sensory nervous system is working uh, will potentially help to do that differentiation between central and peripheral effects. And we may be able to use that as a clinical biomarker, firstly to to identify high-risk individuals for those who might develop neuropathic pain, and also in that precision medicine approach so we can target treatment, as I said. It may need integration of a number of factors beyond, in addition to quantitative sensory testing, we may need to look at genetic influences, patient-reported outcome measures, and also neuroimaging. And that's one of the areas that is currently being developed. So in terms of what's the current evidence that might be useful, there is some work predicting chronic pain after surgery, which has shown that individuals with abnormal heat pain sensitivity, and that's in gynae surgery and other acute pain syndromes, if they have abnormal heat pain sensitivity prior to surgery, they're at higher risk of developing persistent pain. So potentially you can then, at least the individual may be able to give more informed consent and understand um, that they're at higher risk or look at early intervention. Abnormal cold sensitivity, um, and that's using a paradigm called conditioned pain modulation, which interrogates the descending pathways from the brain. That's been shown that if patients have abnormal cold cold sensitivity, that will affect the risk of developing persistent pain after thoracotomy and also in abdominal pain. Those are relatively small studies, those studies. There's a much larger study, which is done by Ia Kals' group in um, Finland, um, and that was looking at 600 patients, 600 women who'd undergone cancer sh- surgery for breast cancer, followed up for three years, and they were all tested prior to their surgery in terms of their detailed phenotyping. And those individuals who were able to tolerate a painful cold stimulus, time to reach a pain score of 10, were less likely to develop persistent pain. So there's beginnings of the evidence starting to pull together that we can actually look at patients and begin to predict who's most at risk because of their underlying neurobiology. So that's predicting risk. Can we use it to direct treatment? So if in an individual sitting in front of me in the clinic with neuropathic pain, the the, the mechanisms are quite different despite the etiology being the same. So someone, say, with peripheral diabetic neuropathy may have quite different mechanisms from the next patient with peripheral diabetic neuropathy. If you look at a new treatment in that patient 
then it's very difficult to work out whether the treatment will be effective. If you understand the mechanisms using the sensory phenotyping, and this is one of the few studies which has used this despite many recommendations that this is how we should be going forward in terms of clinical trials. What they did was they stratified the treatment dependent on the quantitative sensory testing findings. And the patients fell into two groups, those with irritable nociceptors, so peripherally mediated neuropathic pain, and the more centrally mediated group. And if you looked at the number needed to treat overall for this particular treatment, oxcarbazepine in neuropathic pain, it was 6.9, which is okay, but not fantastic. If you then stratified it by the the sensory mechanisms, the irritable nociceptor group, the number needed to treat falls to 3.9, whereas in the centrally mediated pain, the non-irritable nociceptor group, it goes up to 13. So there's absolutely no point, really, in trying it in that group of patients, and this is the group of patients that we need to target. So, again, heartening evidence, I think, that going forward we may start to improve things. It's slightly disheartening that this was published in 2014 and there have been hardly any pharma studies published since then that have used this approach because it requires significant amounts of training and expertise in order to be able to do it in the clinical research setting. So, I'm now going to move on to opioid use, um, particularly focusing on chronic pain. So opioids have been around for a long, long time. They work well for acute pain. Um, one of the mainstays of an anaesthetist uh, you know, managing post-surgical pain. Potentially there may be long-term problems. Again, they work well in cancer pain normally. And the question is, for chronic pain, should we be using opioids at all? So I guess here's a question for you. Raise your hand if you use opioids for acute pain management. And chronic pain management? <laughs> There's a slightly hesitant. So when I ask GPs this question, for chronic pain management, you say, should we be using opioids for chronic pain? None of them put their hands up, pretty much. When I ask them who prescribes opioids for chronic pain, all of them put their hands up. So there's a mismatch as to what we believe and what we're actually doing. Um, And the question is, what's right? If if you're ever bored, you can Google opioids and long-term opioids, and there's a huge amount of coverage in the news and has been for some time. This program here, actually, if you happen to have any free time, was on uh, BBC Two on Horizon last week, and it's a very good program, actually, with some patient views as well. It's worth having a look at um, about the impact of opioids, both positive and negative, actually, in the management of chronic pain. The, the problem with opioids first became apparent in the US quite a long time ago, actually, um, And part of that, well, I'll talk a little bit about the potential reasons for why it is such a major problem in the US and why we may or may not have significant problems here. But you can see here, in 2015, 12.5 million patients were misusing prescription opioids. There was a 402% increase in in therapeutic use. And this is in 2018 when the Surgeon General made a, a, a statement, a national advisory statement, which he does very, very rarely, apparently, Um, about concerns about opioid use. One death every 12 minutes, and that was in 2018. As a result of that, to try and fix the problem, there's a whole number of initiatives which you have a look on the the US websites to try and improve and reduce the use of opioids um, and improve the management um, of misuse. And they've got a whole five-point strategy to combat the opioid crisis. Access to prevention, treatment, recovery, support services, a whole number of factors. One of the questions I think we need to ask ourselves is, is it actually happening in the US and elsewhere? Um, And that's another figure. So 5% of the world's population in the US, which is the US, 80% of the world opioid use. So they're using a lot of opioids over there. So I think it's worthwhile taking a step back to think, why why has this massive increase in opioid use occurred? What's the evidence? Now, what I did thought was interesting to do was to look at the evidence from 10 to 15 years ago, and then come back shortly and compare it to what the evidence is now. So this is not current evidence. But at that point, the balance against efficacy and safety, the caution review, which was published in 2010, recommended that opioids could potentially be used in patients with chronic pain. It acknowledged that there was limited evidence, but it said that the likelihood of addiction was very low, and that was in 2010. What are the influences? There was a lot of new opioids that come in the market over the last 10 to 15 years, um, and very targeted marketing from the pharmaceutical companies, both at healthcare professionals, but in the US also directly to patients as well. So if you like, a two-pronged approach. 
Other things that happened around about the same time, the American Pain Society said that pain should be the fifth vital sign and payment in hospitals was dependent on that being recorded. The unintended consequence was potentially inappropriate prescribing both of opioids and also the dose of opioids. The International Association for the Study of Pain recommended that pain relief is a basic human right and they said, well, if we use opioids for acute and cancer pain, why shouldn't we be using it for chronic pain? And this was around about the time there was lots of publications about adverse effects of non-steroidals and COX-2 inhibitors. So we needed an alternative, so why not use opioids? Additionally, the British Pain Society guidelines and others term, coined the term pseudo-addiction, saying that if someone was display, displaying those red flags that we normally associate with addiction, you know, early scripts, demanding opioids, rapidly increasing doses, that was just because their pain wasn't being treated properly. There's very, very limited evidence for that, other than as a term, there's not really any good scientific evidence. So I think it was a combination of factors has led to this massive increase in opioid use. The other issue was that in terms of the way particularly the pharmaceutical companies um, did the research for registration of new new opioids and analysed them, the technique that was used, I won't go into the details of the statistical techniques, but basically it tended to overestimate the treatment effect. So the knock-on effect of that is that well-recognised and respected organisations at Cochrane, when they were reviewing the evidence, would assess these clinical trials as high-quality clinical trials and therefore were unable to ignore the results of those trials and had to recommend that we should be using opioids for chronic pain. So another thing from that caution view was that said that if people are getting adverse effects from opioids, they usually stop anyway. We know that that's not true. There's a good amount of work to indicate that patients who are getting adverse effects who want to stop will struggle to come off strong opioids. So it's beholden on us as medical practitioners that if we're starting someone on opioids, we really need to think about that risk-benefit analysis. One of the times it's been identified as when opioids are started is after surgery. After someone has come into hospital for a surgical episode and opioids are started, and then there is good evidence that they may not be discontinued appropriately afterwards. There are a number of risk factors of people who are more at risk of, of prolonged opioid use after surgery, Um, And they're the ones that you might expect, so previous drug and alcohol, tobacco misuse, mental health comorbidities, benzodiazepine or antidepressant use, the the association with deprivation, younger age, and also some pain-related factors. So if if we're aware of those factors in the patients that we're seeing for surgery, then we may need to flag up that their management afterwards should be more targeted. And this is a study that was published in JAMA, which looked at prescribing between the US, Canada and Sweden after surgery, and they looked at the number of opioid prescriptions dispensed. And you can see um, this is US and Canada after overall after a number of different types of surgery, and this is Sweden. So there is an absolutely dramatic difference in prescribing practice between countries, and I suspect that is not due to inherent genetic differences in the population. It's due to the system itself and acceptance and expectation of when opioids should be used. So those factors, I think, well, we need to stop opioids, and that's what the US Surgeon General said, and there's all these things put in place. What is very clear, so this is a graph from... 1999 to 2014, it was around about this time point where the concerns about opioids were beginning to become more aware in the general um, medical population. Um, there, actually, it was around about that time point there. Um, at that point, there was a very punitive approach, so people who were being on big doses of prescription opioids had their prescriptions stopped. And despite all the stuff on the websites about providing adequate support services, the adequate support services were not there. So individuals had their opioids stopped and were addicted to the opioids, so they started to use heroin. And that's where you see that dramatic increase in deaths from heroin. And again, I think that's something that we need to be really aware of in this country, that if we are looking to reduce opioid prescribing, we need to be aware of any unintended consequences of doing that. So should we be prescribing opioids? What's the balance of evidence now compared to what it was 10 to 15 years ago? There's been one, one good quality double-blind RCT which has looked at chronic opioid use up to 12 months in a randomised controlled trial. And what that found was that the individuals who were prescribed a strong opioid had worse pain without an improvement in function, so they weren't doing any more, 12 months after starting on the strong opioid compared to those who were managed with non-opioid analgesics. So the evidence for opioids being effective in managing chronic pain long term is not strong. That's only one study and we need to do more. 
In terms of the harms, there's an increasing amount of the harms which may cause, particularly dependence and abuse, opioid-induced hyperalgesia and intolerance, and a number of other factors, including the increased risk of road traffic accident. So that balance between efficacy and safety, based on the current evidence, has changed quite dramatically since that Cochrane review was published in 2010. As a result of the change in the evidence, we updated the sign guideline that was published August last year, um, and we, we updated the opioid section of the sign guideline and changed very significantly the key recommendations from the previous sign guideline published in 2013. So we can consider opioids for short to medium term management only in selected, carefully selected patients who failed other therapies, and we were clear that the benefits <coughs> outweigh the risks. Before you start on an opioid, you agree the treatment goals potentially in writing, and you consider early reduction or sensation, so you're not starting someone on the strong opioid for years or even decades, which is what we often see coming to us in the clinic. There are a whole number of opioid risk screening tools, which may be useful to assess patients who are at higher risk that you might then not want to use an opioid in, or to assess them during treatment so you can flag up if they start to develop a problem with dependency um, or misuse, and you should be looking for those, those features regularly. The other major change, which there was, I have to say, a lot of debate about at the government level, was that we recommended that on doses of more than 15, 50 milligrams morphine equivalent dose per day, they should be re re reviewed regularly, at least annually, and also a <coughs> greater than 90 milligrams per day specialist advice referral. And there was significant concern about that because the concern was that the, the pain services would be overwhelmed and the GPs would be having to chase up specialists. Um, However, that is based on the current evidence as to where the major harms start to occur. Harms start to occur at doses of more than 50 and significant harms at doses of more than 90. So I was certainly pleased that those recommendations, we were allowed to keep those recommendations in despite the potential um, clinical implications in the short term. I think we will say things in the longer term. Additionally, the ISP have updated their view. They published this in 2013, 2018 um, and they no longer recommend routine use of strong opioids for chronic pain long term. Again, it's medium term use, low dose opioid therapy. So quite a dramatic change in the international recommendations and also national recommendations of how we should be using these drugs. It's interesting to have a look at what's happening in Scotland because that's the patient population that we're dealing with and it's different from the patient, in, patient population in the US. So we looked at this, um, we used ISD data and we linked it to Generation Scotland data. 3.7 million opioid prescriptions um, and a significant increase into 2012, up to 5.9 million opioid prescriptions. So that's all opioids, including cocodamol, uh, tramadol. For strong opioids, again, a significant increase. And one of the very surprising and slightly shocking facts was that in 2012, 18% of the Scottish population were prescribed some form of opioid. So that's a lot of patients receiving opioids. Now, we know that 18% may have chronic pain, so it might be completely appropriate prescribing. Um, we tried to look into that in a little bit more detail. There's clearly variation by health board. Uh, you always like to see where you stand on a lead table. Here we are, round about the middle in Tayside. Your likelihood of being prescribed a strong opioid was associated with deprivation levels. So those living in areas of high deprivation were much more likely to be prescribed a strong opioid. Perhaps hearteningly, those with severe pain were more likely to be prescribed a strong opioid, although only 47% of individuals with severe pain were on an opioid. Also, as a marker of poor prescribing, we looked at benzodiazepine co-prescribing because that is not a good combination of strong opioid and benzodiazepine. And we found significant numbers, particularly if you're a female and in the age group 25 to 40, you had a 40% chance of being co-prescribed a benzodiazepine. So... I think there are indicators that some of the prescribing within Scotland is perhaps not appropriate prescribing. Um, this is a tool from, the, uh, from ISD, the National Therapeutics Indicators, and you can actually look, it's not real time because it only goes up to a couple of months ago, but we can see how prescribing has changed since we did that study, which looked at the 2012 data. And you can see here in Scotland that opioid prescribing overall has come down, and it's come down in Tayside, although we're still above the national average. Um, and we've been relatively static over the last year, um, which is interesting because one of the things that I was interested in is whether updating the sign guideline in August of last year would be reflected in a change in opioid prescribing 
There may be a lag time, but we're certainly not seeing it yet. And that's a question perhaps about guideline implementation. Right, how we do. Right, I'm going to move on quickly to clinical challenges in terms of neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain, pain arising as a direct consequence of a lesion or disease affecting the somatosensory nervous system, affects about 7 to 10% of the population. There's a number of causes. Surgery is one of the, one of the major causes that potentially you can intervene and prevent, as is chemotherapy, chemotherapy neuropathy, with particular forms of commonly used chemotherapy, and diabetes, um, again, very common condition. We've got limited treatment options in terms of efficacy and side effects, and it makes patients miserable. So chronic pain makes patients miserable. Chronic neuropathic pain makes patients even more miserable. We have evidence of that. 17% of them rate their quality of life as worse than death if they've got neuropathic pain. And there are many patients that I used to see in my um, cancer, cancer pain clinic with chemoneuropathy who very clearly didn't wish that they hadn't had successful cancer treatment because their quality of life was so poor from their chemoneuropathy. So it's a significant problem. As I said, the, the, the first step to managing it properly is to assess it properly. So comprehensive assessment, I'll talk a little bit about the screening tools that might be useful. Um, and the bedside QST, the quantitative sensory testing, to try and understand the mechanisms a bit better. You don't need um, tens of thousands of pounds worth of kit to do quantitative sensory testing. You can very simply look at some of the changes in sensation using bits of kit that are often lying about in the clinic or the ward. In terms of the screening tools, perhaps as a recognition of our difficulty for non-specialists in diagnosing neuropathic pain, around about the same time, there was a whole number of screening tools produced across the world. Um, the Leeds Assessment of Neuropathic Signs and Symptoms, the Dolorous, uh, DN4 Neuropathic Pain Questionnaire, so a range of those, validated in smallish numbers of patients. One of the things that's interesting is to look at what the symptoms that are common across all those questionnaires, because they're all slightly different, some are in much more detail. And I think those are the key things that if you're in a clinical setting that you should be asking patients or flagging up. So if someone is describing their pain using those descriptors, or on examination you're finding these findings, so pain brushing with cotton wool, or a raised pinprick threshold, so less sensitive to the pinprick than neuropathic, then you're, you're flagging up that that individual is likely to have neuropathic pain. So you have to start to manage it appropriately. As I said, there's a whole range of uh, pharmacological therapies that we can use, and this is probably one of the best systematic reviews of meta-analysis that was done by the International Neuropathic Pain Group. Um, and what they found was that, the, the, hearteningly perhaps, the quality of the evidence was moderate to high. There was some overestimation of treatment effect, perhaps similar to what we've seen with opioids in the past. And they produced a bit of a lead table to try and guide us as to what we should be using first line and second line. So the Loxtein, reasonable evidence. The gabapentinoids, reasonably high NNC, but good evidence. And the tricycline. Tricycline is the lowest NNT, but as anyone who's prescribed an, um, tricyclic antidepressants, side effects often um, interfere with reaching an effective dose. And then the second line therapies, and then down weak third line, strong opioids are there. Um, I thought it was also interesting to look at the Canadian guidelines because they are a little bit different. You think, well, the evidence is the evidence, um, but they have produced slightly different guidelines. Again, similar at the top of their pathway, gabapentinoids, tricyclics, and the serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, but they actually have opioid analgesics It's quite high up on the list, and they also have cannabinoids. I'm not sure what they base their evidence on, and it will be very interesting to see what happens in terms of cannabinoid prescribing and potential problems from that um, in Canada in um, as the opioids are higher up. So I think that's one of the problems with guidelines is that they're based on evidence and there may be limitations. There often are imita limitations with the evidence. So on that note, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the gabapentinoids. So that's pregabalin and gabapentin, which are first line therapies in all the guidelines for neuropathic pain. So a number of years ago, um, in my pain and addiction service in Edinburgh, I became aware that the prison population really wanted to be prescribed gabapentinoids. Um, we looked at it in the substance misuse population, and we found out that about 19% of those prescribed pregabalin were misusing it. Um, there's been other work done which shows that among past and current opioid users, there is some evidence of abuse of the gabapentinoids, 
and also it's starting to turn up in non-fatal overdoses. And this, this is figures um, from the Substance Misuse Service here um, and from the Scottish Ambulance Service looking at non-fatal overdose. And with the gabapentinoids, they were all of them apart from one, they were, they were um, overdosing with a strong opioid, usually actually methadone or buprenorphine prescribed for opioid replacement therapies. So starting to show up in the non-fatal overdoses and... Disappointingly, also showing up in drug-related deaths. You'll know that we were pretty high up in the league of drug-related deaths in Scotland, and Tayside in particular, um, and gabapentinoids are showing up in the toxicology of an increasing number of patients um, with drug-related deaths. So this is prescribing, so this is not death, and you can see there's an increase, as we saw with opioid prescribing in the States, over a number of years. And if you look at the reports of pre or gabapentin, in the toxicology of the drug-related deaths over this time period, 2012 to 2018, again, you can see a significant increase. So I have a slight concern that we have moved from having a problem with opioids, and we probably still have a problem with opioids, to creating another problem. And the question that I suspect many of you are asking is, well, if we can't use opioids, we can't use gabapentinoids, and non-steroids have lots of contraindications, what can we use for chronic pain? So let's look at the evidence. In fact, the best evidence for what will increased quality of life and function long term is to use physical activity. And we did a caution or overview review of this, which showed that exercise is good for chronic pain. There's not good evidence as to what type of exercise we should be using, nor intensity. And also, in terms of clinical research going forward, we need to better under, understand how to measure activity in patients with chronic pain. Because you, we all know that if you say to someone, you have to increase your physical activity, you have to exercise more, we go, yeah, 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 I'll I'll join the gym, and how often does it happen? That was my New Year's resolution, and actually we're not even at the end of January, and it's failed already. So we need to understand better how we can support patients to increase their physical activity. Another thing is, is it just making patients feel better and getting them a bit fitter that helps with their chronic pain, or is there actually an underlying neurobiological reason? And this is some early work from Dave Bennett in Oxford, where he looked at individuals with diabetic neuropathy and they were randomised to either just standard care or an actual um, physiotherapy intervention that did significantly increase their levels of physical activity. And they found changes in the peripheral nervous system. So in diabetic peripheral neuropathy, the intraepidermal nerve fibre density drops and that correlates with the severity of pain. In the exercise group after a year, there was an increase. There was some recovery in that intraepidermal nerve fibre density. Um, and as I say, the lower levels were associated with painful neuropathy, and there was no change in the counselling group. So there's perhaps some beginning of evidence as to that increasing your physical activity is more than just being fitter, that it might actually impact on the underlying neurobiology. And I would like to, I'm just about finished, I just want to say that we have started, a CIS, or about to start a CSO-funded study to try and understand better how we can support patients with chronic pain to increase their physical activity. We looked at it in patients in the Lothian Chronic Pain Service where I was based. More than 90% of them were doing virtually nothing. We tell them that they should be doing more. We refer them to physio. They are still doing virtually nothing. So we need to do things differently. So one of the issues is that at an individual level, everyone likes to do things differently. So if you refer someone to the gym and they've never been to the gym in their life, no member of their family has ever been to the gym in their life and they can't afford to get there, that's not going to work. So this study is to start to understand in a systematic way, using an evidence-based approach, what are the barriers and facilitators at an individual level, but taking account of the cultural and social factors as well, in order to develop a clinical decision support tool. SUST, Blair Smith came up with the acronym, he's very good at those. Um, And then the next phase of that, once we've developed it, will be to test it in clinical practice. So... And that is working with the Green Health Partnership, which is a collaboration with NHS Tayside and E-Council and uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, where they are trying to pull together community-based resources to support individuals to do more, particularly in terms of physical activity. Um, So that's something that we actually in the pain clinic can refer to now, um, and presumably you can even out with the pain clinic. Another thing at a local level that may be helpful for you There's a number of resources on the intranet, the non-neuropathic pain prescribing treatment algorithms, and also those for neuropathic pain. The one that is currently in preparation that's not available yet is looking at those non-pharmacological approaches because I think that is where we should be going, and that's where we need to develop our support strategies 
in order to get patients off the medications, which potentially are not doing them any good and are causing significant harm. So it's, it's, the, it's the challenge to move the queue from there to there. Um, ask me back in a couple of years' time and we'll see where we are with that. Finish with a quick acknowledgement um, and also a plug for the Scottish Pain Research Community Annual Scientific Meeting. It's free if you're a student. You can register on Eventbrite and that's in West Park in next, actually, uh, towards the end of March. Um, and that is just to get that. Right. I, I think this is all fascinating, and, and I, I think particularly think it's fascinating as I'm one of the 18% of people who have chronic pain, um, and I have chronic neuropathic pain, uh, post-infective, so I, an awful lot of this resonates with me, particularly the, the description of the misery which comes with neuropathic pain. It is, it is truly miserable. And, and I went through all of those things, gabapentin and pregabalin and deluxe and all the things, and, and, and that's miserable as well. And then one person said to me, one of your colleagues said to me, Probably the best thing to do is exercise, and here I am now, <laughs> um, and that, the amount of exercise I do, and it's the only thing that controls my neuropathic pain, is this crazy amount of exercise I do. So when people say to me, why do you do all this crazy amount of exercise, this is why. Um, anyone got any questions or comments? Any, I'm sure that's brought up some people have got some comments. Alex, I'll just turn this microphone on for you. He says, there you go. Thanks very much. Very, very interesting indeed. Uh, can I ask two questions, um, just sort of related, I guess. Um, so the first one is about exercise and chronic pain. Um, one of the first things many patients say to me when I'm talking to them about exercise and, and, and they have pain is that the pain actually prevents them from taking exercise because of where the pain is or, or how the pain gets exacerbated by exercise, so it's, it's, that's interesting that there must be a subgroup of people for whom pain or, or exercise does make, make pain worse. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. Also within chronic pain as well, recognise the syndrome of fear avoidance, so if you do something that hurts, you do less, so you get more and more deconditioned. And in terms of you know, modern pain management, I think our physio has gone to our clinic to actually use the modern pain management approach, but part of the training with that is to address that fear avoidance in order that patients can start to build up an exercise. Mm -hmm. And rather than doing the sort of boom and bust cycling of when you, you have a good day, you try and get everything done, and then you're laid up for a couple of days afterwards and you never get reconditioned, it's trying to support them mm. to actually have that individu individualised management plan. And that's very much what we're aiming to do with the TUST intervention. Okay. Uh, and the other question was very interesting. You started off your talk with the issue of expectation of pain reduction and how those very interesting results... And I guess one of the ramifications of that or questions around that is um, how long does that effect last for and is there room for um, that kind of uh, expectation induction in, in the chronic pain setting? The, the, the imaging study was patients who didn't have chronic pain, so it was inflicting pain on medical mm. students. So it's difficult to extrapolate from that as to how long that effect would last for. What we do know is that the psychological techniques for which there is evidence in managing chronic pain, so cognitive behavioural therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness, that those will actually impact on different bits of the pain neuromatrix within the brain. Um, and there's some quite nice work where it actually almost activates the similar systems to the opioid systems. Mm. If you can use the psychological techniques, you can tap into those. Yeah, two questions again, please. Thank you so much. Um, there's been a bit in the media about the risk, possible risk of increased risk of dementia in patients on tricyclics. So what do you say in clinic if a patient who's on amitriptyline for neuropathic pain asks about that? And can we access acupuncture at all now um, in NHS Tayside? Um, I haven't been in NHS Tayside that long, but as far as I'm aware, we can access acupuncture. I think it, it was historically provided within the service. Um, the evidence for acupuncture for chronic pain is pretty limited, and we... You know, there's a lack of evidence. It's not that there's evidence that's not good. Um, so I think it's it's difficult to argue for it in in view of other things that may be effective. There is some evidence for it being man useful in managing acute on chronic flare-ups. Um, for the tricyclics, as with all, pretty much all the medications that we use, will have some significant serious adverse effects. Whether it's opioids, gabapentinins, gabapentinoids, tricyclics, non-steroidals, paracetamol, even. So. 
I always say it's a balance of the risks and benefits. So if you can increase someone's physical activity and function and improve their quality of life so that they're able to do things, then that will often weigh the risks of potential longer-term effects. And at that point, actually, you can start to look at cutting back the medication once they get reconditioned. So, yeah. <coughs> Hi, um, I work in mental health physiotherapy, um, so me and Jill both. When I was listening to all your pain t- talk about the medication, I was thinking, please mention physical activity and all the other <laughs> things, because that's what we do. And we see a lot that come from pain clinic from Lynn. And, and um, yeah, everything you've said, getting them into physical activity in a supported environment. So what you said about people coming in and saying, oh, you know, I can't exercise because it's too sore. We get them in and support them, show them exactly what they can be doing, support them over a certain period of time, and then take them into the community, take them into somewhere that's close to them, somewhere they can get to, use the Active for Life scheme, get them into a pool. I take people up to Lochy. Once they've done a few weeks with me in a supported environment, then they can continue to do it themselves. Maybe a Friday's better. And I have quite a few people, the, the, the group of them will go another day or if Olympia's better, whatever else is on. So when you mentioned your study, like, it was really, really interesting. So some of it's happening, but yeah, it, and the benefits. It might not be, I mean, you know what chronic pain's like. They'll say, oh, I, can, I can walk up my stairs one day and it was 10 out of 10 pain and the next day. But then they'll say, oh, but I did go swimming. And actually, they might say their pain's still 10 out of 10, but they got to the shops and they went swimming and their quality of life and that, everything's better. So it's just, yeah, we're, we're seeing it working, but it's really yeah. good that... No, I think, I think it's a very good point it. about the improved quality of life, despite mm-hmm. their pain intensity still being yeah. relatively high, because that's what we didn't see in the opioid study, that their pain scores were high, but they weren't doing any more. Hi, Birgit Wafers. I'm a neonatologist, and I guess I've got a comment rather than a question. It relates to what was asked over there. Um, there is pretty good evidence from studies in neonates, especially preterm neonates that have gone through neonatal intef- intensive care, that their pain perception and neural pathways to do with pain are altered for life through the experience they've had in the neonatal unit. And there's also, as far as I know, from pediatric chronic pain work, Um, good evidence around maladaptive behavioural and pain perception changes if you see maladaptive behaviour or or poor pain control in the environment around you. So these things, same as the cardiovascular stuff, are laid um, early and um, you need to start in childhood where you can to try and and work on these. I think that's a very good point. In early life adversity, there is some evidence that will increase central neuroinflammation which increase your risk of chronic pain and also depression, actually. So. I'm Chris Pell. I'm a, a general adult psychiatrist, and again, we see huge numbers of people coming through with a combination of chronic pain and depression, and it, it, it's the same sort of advice. I mean, I think, I think it's good that you're touching on the psychological impact and expectation and all these things. Do, do you think that there's just a key thing about exercise helping thing helping symptoms that make people miserable you know it gives structure it gives companionship it gives socialization all of these things seem to help in both i mean we've got walking groups for uh, our mental health patients you know is there a common yeah no, I, I, th- I think that's probably right one thing that actually came out of the um, patient work that we did when we were developing the grant was that a using the word exercise is not helpful to someone in chronic pain because there's an immediate fear response and actually, in terms of what someone measures an increase in function of success, the, it can vary enormously. So one patient said, actually, if I can get out of my bed and go and sit in the chair, that's better than most days. So I think that's why the kind of average approach to assessing exercise interventions, it's difficult to say one particular type of exercise is going to be effective. Uh, hi. Uh, following on from that point, um, I'd like to know your thoughts on how often you think there's not really a pathological disease process, but it's functional pain in in your clinic. So people labelled with um, neuropathic pain may not have, as the definition said, a a disease process that can be demonstrated, but it's rather functional. And does it matter? And, uh, you know, I think it's quite an important area. 
Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. How, how long have you got, actually? But the, there is, so things like the chronic widespread pain syndromes, fibromyalgia, you say, well, that, that are the functional pains. And maybe that's just because we don't understand them properly. And again, Irene Tracy's lab, they looked at particular areas of the brain that are involved in central sensitivity and hyperalgesia, which is one of the things that comes across very clearly in fibromyalgia. And they did isolate a particular area within the brainstem. And the hypothesis is that actually something goes wrong within that. It's not that the patients are being difficult or just kind of making up their pain, that actually there is a, there is a pathological problem within the neuronal system itself. Okay, um, time has beaten us here. It's uh, already five to one, so uh, five to two. So we'll call it a day at there. That. Thank you very much. Um, clearly, a very popular topic and a fantastic speaker. Thanks very much for coming. See you next week for cardiology. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>